Today's guest is Dr. Mohammed Khalifa, who is Professor of Educational Administration and Executive Director for Urban Education Initiatives at The Ohio State University. Before coming to OSU, Dr. Khalifa held the Robert Beck Endowed Professorship in the Department of Organizational Leadership, Policy and Development at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Having worked as a public school teacher and administrator in Detroit, Dr. Khalifa's research examines how urban school leaders enact culturally responsive leadership practices. His latest book, Culturally Responsive School Leadership, was published by Harvard Education Press in 2018. He has led equity audits in the United States as a way to reduce achievement and discipline gaps in schools, and he is the first to develop and use online equity audits for schools. He is also president and CEO of Culturally Responsive School Leadership Institute and has conducted extensive work in research, teaching coursework, and leading delegations in non-Western cultural contexts too. Dr. Khalifa, we're delighted to have you today, and now it's, it's over to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, I, I would, if it's okay, just uh, like to share a few notes and then uh, just if you have any follow-up questions or maybe we can just enter into dialogue. I always appreciate dialogue a little bit more. Um, I, I'm happy to, to kind of share what I do. Uh, I think um, finally in the United States is being seen as a premier type of leadership and not something that one pulls out of their uh, back pocket once they feel they've exhausted all other uh, types of leadership, but rather culturally responsive school leadership is now being seen as a premier and one of the most important like leadership expressions, one could say. And the reason why is because, uh, for, you know, because of our history as human beings. Uh, what, what has happened with colonization uh, around the world, uh, some countries colonizing other countries and then pulling armies back, but leaving the rationale and the thought has really uh, begun to permeate um, so many things. And, and what happens is that you have people who have access to more education and people who have access to less education in, uh, throughout America. And it's not been something that most traditional school leadership scholars and researchers have been able to tackle. And so culturally responsive school leadership at its core seeks to enhance and improve education for those students whom traditional leaders have been unable to reach and who have been unable to uh, uh, set up school context or develop curriculums or hire and recruit and, and develop teachers in ways that serve the needs of the most underserved. And this has been a perduring problem in an American context, and it is something that is required by federal law. It's something that most presidents for the past 150 years have spoken of. It's something that almost all university presidents speak of, presidents, all leaders of schools and dis districts speak of this whole notion of equity uh, and serving the most underserved, but hardly any of them do it well. So uh, I want to speak a little bit about my, res my, my research. I guess I'll share a little bit about my background first. Um, my, I, I am uh, a product of Detroit, Michigan, which was uh, a massive automotive city. Uh, and it's General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, all of them are located in Detroit. And around the time that my grandparents went up there, uh, they were uh, enslaved Africans, which is this history that I'm talking about. We'll get more to that later. But uh, they left the South. All four of my grandparents left the South and came up to work in industry. Um, and that is how they ended up in Michigan along. So it's referred to as a migration. Many, many people kind of uh, came North to work in those. And so I, I, anyway, they ended up in Detroit working in the automotive industry. And I was a teacher there. My parents were teachers in the same city the first to be educated uh, in their families. Uh, but also, as Gavin, uh, uh, my good friend was saying, I do a lot of international work from delegation work to development work. I've taught courses to Cuba, Jamaica, uh, Morocco, uh, Ghana, South Africa, and uh, done the development work in the Middle East, places like Qatar and Pakistan. 
And I think that it's important for us to, to uh, contribute in ways that are non-exploitative and non-exotic in uh, non-Western spaces that have also been uh, the victims of colonial empire exp expansionist uh, actions from the Western world. So because of that, I uh, also have decided to take up research. So the, the examples on, of research that you see uh, <clears throat> are all things that I published over the last 10 years or so in places like educational administration quarterly, uh, educational uh, you know, leadership journals and administration journals, uh, but also in very wide ranging, the, the most highly rated education journal there is, which is Review of Education Research in terms of impact factor. I also published an article there, which happens to be the most cited article in all of education leadership for the past five years. Uh, and, and as well, my, 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 my book, which is also up there, is the top selling leadership, educational leadership book in the United States in Canada right now. Um, it's, un, it's atypical to see a book sell 25,000 copies. That's an academic book. So we're very happy about that. And which signals to me that the field is ready for change. The field is ready to start talking more seriously about equity and to start seeing culturally responsive school leadership as a premier and a centered, not a fringe, but a centered type of leadership within education and schools. And that we as humans are trying to do better. Uh, I won't talk about these examples of research. I was going to spend time, but I, I want to get to our conversation part. So why don't we just kind of jump right in and maybe we can come back to the slide and talk more specifically about some of the research. I guess I'll say generally about all of them uh, that I uh, started to write very early on about how school leaders can engage communities, meaning have a presence in communities, situate their schools so that their schools can have a presence in communities and allow access to the building and not have this very strong border or, or barrier between schools and communities. And that does several things um, that enhances a teacher's and a leader and a school leader's ability to become culturally responsive because they're learning now. It's not the colonial model of I have knowledge, I have expertise, and I'm going to help you, oh, you poor soul. And I'm going to save you. That is very much how colonialists describe their actions when they were going to different spaces around the world, that these are savages that we're saving and I'm, I'm here as the savior. So instead of that, what, what, what I argue for in most of my work is to know what you need to do is develop true community with people you serve in their spaces and allow them into your space for that. Develop rapport, cr trust, credibility. But the only way to do that is to advocate for things that are important to them, whether or not they're even school related issues, because that is how education has always happened from the people who invented schools. And we can talk about that history at another time. But universities is an invention. They were more concerned about the welfare of the people than only conveying knowledge. And so um, and, and what I argue in my work is the way to do that is to advocate for community-based causes. Usually, just imagine this, Gavin, if you were in a relationship with someone, and when you have a problem in the relationship, it's completely dependent on one person's interpretation, when the problem should be talked about, what should be done to solve the problem, when it is indeed solved, all of these questions about the relationship is predicated on one person in that relationship. None of us would stay in a relationship like that, but that's exactly the relationship that schools tend to have with people. They claim they're serving, right? And so, um, what I try to what I try to do with my research is to uh, establish a different way of thinking about that. Um, if for, for example, our, our, pre, our previous president, Donald Trump, uh, weaponized a number of organizations against certain populations of people in our country. So he weaponized, for example, the immigration organization uh, um, against Latino families and, would, and they would come to schools to arrest parents on school grounds. 
Now, is this an education issue? I would argue that it is, but most people might not see that as an education issue. Granted, that's fine. But if it's a pain or trauma that your community is dealing with, how can you claim that you care about these people and serve them and you're silent about that or about the fact that there are no jobs in their neighborhood or if it's a food desert or air pollution or anything like that? If these are real issues that people are dealing with and you think you can show up as an administrator and not say anything or speak to the issues that they serve and, and claiming that that, could, that that might be, uh, you know, a cause for you to lose your job or any of these other excuses that administrators tend, that's not an education issue. Well, that's a very colonial form of showing up, which is what, what I've been kind of pushing up against in, in, in my research. And I do that in a number of different ways. So maybe we'll have time later. But let's get to culturally responsive school leadership, because that's, that's I think, why you invited me in to talk. So we, we conducted a lit review back in 2016. This is the article that was in review of education research. I published that with Professor Mark Gooden and Professor James Davis. Mark Gooden is at Teachers College Columbia. And Professor James Davis is at Temple University, both full professors. And uh, we did this lit review and we looked at all of the literature that we could get our hands on that might speak to what culturally responsive school leadership is. And we found that there were more or less four buckets. There are four buckets of what culturally responsive, what, what, pe so, so just so you know, we, we, when we looked culturally responsive school leadership, we didn't get very far, <laughs> obviously. But when you look up indigenous Muscogee leadership or uh, Latino immigrant leadership or African American leadership or some sort of, you know, I mean, when, when you use, leadership or community engagement or all so 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 you look at on, on the one hand in terms of the cultural part of culturally responsive school leadership you look at all of these different subgroups and then more comes up and then instead of only looking at leadership we look at all of these other things that are functions of leadership and use keywords there and so when you do that you get you get a lot further along and, and so uh, we looked for empirical articles mainly, although there might have been just a couple of theoretical articles in there. And of the hundreds of articles we found, these four areas emerged of what culturally responsive school leadership is. Um, self Critically self-reflects on leadership behaviors. That is the top left quadrant in this uh, diagram here. And what that body of literature requires us to do is ask how are we replicating or reproducing or contributing to oppression in an organization or how are we arresting how are we confronting any type of oppression or marginalization or disadvantaging students how are we searching for that and when we find it because it is in every school in the world i would argue even if it's if they're uh you know, demographically homogeneous, all of the same. There are always, unfortunately, this has become human behavior. There are always power relationships at play where some people are disadvantaged and some are advantaged. And in this top right, in this top left quadrant, that requires us as leaders to, to be very aware and to be confronting and challenging and putting in institutional and personal change as a way of addressing that. Then the top right quadrant is, is the way how most school leaders see themselves as instructional leaders. So there are culturally responsive questions that instructional leaders must ask, which we'll be talking about. Uh, people uh, unfortunately assume that you can do equity over here in this little box and then you go on with schools as normal and that people's awareness of equity or understanding will automatically lead to a shift in behavior and practice. And give, let, me, let me let the big cat out of the bag. It never does. It never automatically shifts over. So when you observe teachers, when you hire teachers, when you establish professional learning communities, anything associated with instruction 
goes into that box. And there, it, there are culturally responsive ways of doing everything that I've, I've just talked about. In the bottom left box, uh, in the book, which this, this, this article informed my book, I brought, had, it was so much in this box, I had to break it into two chapters. So what's in that box is the school context and climate. How are students feeling there? Are they feeling a sense of belonging? Are they feeling uh, that they uh, are, are seeing themselves in their teachers? Are they, are, they, are they seeing that teachers have hostile uh, reception for them or their parents? All of these things. And, and also that is connected to student identity because there, there are things like cultural capital, social capital that allow some student, uh, some student identities in America that tends to be white and middle-class more access to schooling than it does all other people, lower SES and people of color, um, African-Americans such as myself, indigenous people from these lands. Uh, all of those students have identities that are not recognized as valuable in schools, uh, they're not welcomed in schools, and they're often, um, you know, less represented throughout the curriculum, more represented in the discipline programs, any type, type of academic enrichment programs. It's very typical, for example, for just to give you an example, to go into a school, the typical school in America, and find that any of the advanced classes and the gifted and talented classes, let's say the school is 50-50, 50% white, 50% students of color, just to make the math easy. You go to the gifted and talented program, it's 98, 90 to 95% white. And then you go to the disciplinary program and it's 80 to 90% non-white, the people who are in trouble in school, the students who are in trouble in schools, all right? Now you might say, well, hey, I can't do anything about it if the non-white people are less intelligent. Not the case, not the case, that's the point. The point is, is that white teachers saw more value in the white students because the teaching staff tends to be mainly white and therefore they recommend it, they recommend it, those white students to be in the gifted and talented programs. And even when they do run an assessment to determine who's there, the assessments tend to reflect the knowledge and the lived experiences of white people. So that advantages white people, white students. And then you might say, hey, well, if, if they're in the suspension room or if they're in the discipline room more often than their white classmates, I can't do anything if they're misbehaving. Well, that's also not true. We know that from, from many, many researchers who have been doing this for decades, that behaviors in student, excuse me, differences in student behaviors is not the explanat is not an explanator, explanator. <laughs> you have to realize I'm talking in my sleep. It's not an explanatory factor because it's very early here. I'm, I, normally I'm, I'm just now waking up. So you have to forgive me. And instead of drinking uh, <laughs> coffee, I'm drinking hot water because my, I'm nursing my voice. Uh, I have to teach tonight. It's not an explanatory factor. In other words, students of color don't behave more poorly than white students. Rather, the teachers, again, again, it is the teachers and the leaders who see them as more threatening. There's an adultification process. There's research that suggests that teachers, that you know, uh, whites in general in America see black boys, you know, African-American boys, as older, as larger, as more threatening. For example, there was a 12 year old kid here in Ohio, the state where I live. This is just one example of, of, what, of why the discipline uh, disproportionalities are there. Uh, the, because of colonial lies that colonialists told themselves over 500 years ago, this, this, these narratives have lived on. The police officer pulled up next to this kid who was playing with a toy, a toy gun with his friend the kid was 12 years old. He was under 100 pounds. The police officer got out, shot the boy, and killed him in less than a second flat. And his explanation was, was there was an adult. The kid was 12. There was an adult, okay, who was 200 pounds and about six feet tall. 
and he was about 18 or 19 years old. So this adultification of boys of color is very typical. And when teachers see that, even though they're seeing something that's not there, but when they think they see that, then of course the punishment will be harsher for them. And there are all other reasons that researchers have been, it's not my area of expertise, but I read this research that researchers talk about to explain why this happens, right? And so uh, that, that, that student identity piece and whether or not the school climate is compatible with that is, is was, it lives within this box. And then in the bottom right hand corner, uh, that comes to community engagement, which is the centerpiece of all of the other areas and the centerpiece of a lot of my research, which is how do you non exoticize communities? How do you non tokenize communities? How do you be, become non appropriating with communities? But how do you, with all of those things in mind, approach communities in ways and establish authentic, authentic partnerships and relationships with people that you say you serve? Again, we say we're serving and we have a very top down authoritarian connection with the people that we say we're serving and that we care about. Now, I had anticipated to spend about two, two to three minutes on this slide and I've spent 10 times that. So I'm gonna be a lot quicker now. <laughs> and I am gonna skip through some things. I'll just say a couple of things about this slide um, that we hold as assumptions within our work. Number one, oppression is automatically reproduced. It does not matter if you were the colonialist that started a colonial relationship with someone 400 or 500 years ago. That, that doesn't matter. If the discourse and if the thinking associated with that lives on and it's in your school and you show up as a leader in that place, nobody put a gun to your head and forced you to become a leader, right? You chose to become a leader and you took responsibility for that. That means that you have a role to play in stopping things that are their trends of overrepresentation of disciplining certain people or others who are not regarded as smart and included in smart classes others who are not if you if all if you have a diverse student body and all of your teachers are all uh, irish in a particular building that's a problem right and that is a type of everybody deserves to see people that look like them who can understand them a little more teaching them right everybody in the world deserves that so um all, any oppressive trends that you have in your building are automatically reproduced that's one assumption. I'll talk about uh, just one more of these, and that's the very last bullet point. And that is that our work is not only critical, we're not only critiquing oppression, but we are also trying to be decolonial, humanizing, and community empowering. And let me explain what that means. There are always people on every faculty and every staff that believe that they can get some critical theory by Foucault or some other theorist, and then begin cr critiquing everyone else. Oh, you're oppressive. Oh, this. That's not the purpose of this work. I just want to be very clear. That's not the purpose of the work. In fact, that is the easier of the two lifts that one must do if they're two birds of a wing. That's part of what we have to do. We're looking to become, uh, however, a lot more effective than just that. And so what we're trying to do is change people and change systems by using knowledge from the community. So it takes something, it takes a different skill set to go into the communities and to find, for example, how knowledge is conveyed in communities or other things that they perceive as realities to lift that knowledge up, to lift the community based or the ancestral knowledge that people have with them and that communities have to lift that up and to have that reflect in your policies, your school policies to have that reflect in the school practices, to have that be reflected inside of the curriculum. You can see that this is far more difficult than just critiquing someone about oppression. This requires true partnership with communities so that you can, you and your staff can learn from them. So teachers uh, can do this work, but leaders have to lead and manage this work. So we're not talking about management now. At, at this point, we're talking about leadership now. Because if you're talking about management, all you're worried is the day-to-day -day operations of a building. But if you're talking about leadership, and if you're talking about culturally responsive leadership, now all of these other questions are on the table, right? And so um, I'll stop with, with this slide and I'll uh, go through this one quickly uh, because I think we just are running out of time and I want our conversation to start. These are the chapters in the book. I was gonna speak a little extra 
about chapter one and two, but we just don't have time for that. So I'm just going to just run through all of the chapters of the book. The book was birthed out of my experience, both as a teacher in Detroit and as a leader in Detroit. There were questions that I had from classroom experiences that I just could not answer. Uh, so I, I, I endeavored upon a PhD to become a system level leader in Detroit. And when I did so, I fell in love with my research and I continued this line of research. And the chapters in the book, uh, let's just get to them. Uh, in chapter one, I look deeply at community-based knowledge and epistemology is a word that reflects the lived experiences of the people there versus the school-based. And are they compatible? And if not, why not? Why are they compatible or not compatible? And, and Gavin, this is a much longer lecture. Usually I spend 30 to 45 minutes just talking about chapter one and chapter two because they're sort of the framing chapters of the book. Chapter one, looking at the epistemology, the knowledge that people have, because the problem is not that white people or Europeans and Africans and black people or Latinos, the problem is not only that they have epistemology. Everybody has epistemology. That's just your lived experience that you bring. The problem though, is that you come to school as a leader, you have power. You can determine if someone is misbehaving. You can determine if somebody deserves to be put in a, a gifted and talented class. You can determine if somebody needs to bring their parents. You, can, you have all of these levers of power, all right? And the problem is somebody has to lead a school. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you know, criticizing the fact that some people have more power in schools, but let's get back to epistemology for a second. My problem is not that you as, as a European have an epistemology or that I as an African-American have an epistemology. My problem is though, that people show up in schools and they pretend like they don't have epistemologies. They pretend to be just neutral arbiters of the school policy. Hey, this is the school policy. There's nothing I can do about. It. You're using your entire history. The discourses you heard your father your grandfather, your uncles, the people in your community talk about, and you have this lived reality that is different from the person that you're judging and that you're using your power with. It's different from theirs. So if you show up and you say, hey, you're being very loud in school today, or you're being disrespectful or aggressive, those are based on your histories. That kid might not see himself as loud, aggressive, or anything that you're describing him as, but you hold the power and you can continue to pretend like you don't have epistemology and you can continue to pretend like you you don't have this interpretive power that when it comes to policy when somebody comes up from your village or your city and they do that you say oh don't worry you know i understand i'll talk to mark mark is your father or your cousin or something i'll work this out with your dad but you know to do better but when it's a kid who's an immigrant comes now well this is the policy what can we do Right, and so <clears throat> I go deep in, into this around that. In chapter two, I talk, well, let's just get to it. Let's just uh, stop at each chapter for one, one to two minutes and then, and then I'll wrap it up. So we, in chapter one, I, I talked about it a little bit, so we'll go through this quickly, but you know, some of the things, so I, I have an academy that goes along with this book. It's a 2.5 day academy that we've been doing across the United States for school leaders. And we, we, we do delve into, both material and discursive considerations of epistemology. But what we do in the academy to mirror this, we do a lot of different activities. But one of the activities we do is six Ds of unlearning. So how can you begin to unlearn about you? How can, well, in order to unlearn behaviors, you have to first learn something. You have to learn about yourself. You have to historicize yourself. You have to historicize the communities you serve. And we use this activity as a way of doing that in addition to other activities. So the other kind of, um, so what, before we move on, what most leaders like to do is they like to start in at step number one, and then they like to go all the way down to step five and six. That's what managers do. Leaders who are culturally responsive though, spend a lot more time in steps two and three so they can begin the unlearning process, if that makes sense. All right. So another kind of ag activity that we do that's associated with this chapter and our culturally responsive school leaders. So, so there are a lot of activities throughout the book. 
I tried to write this book for practitioners, but with a scholarly tone. So I'm just, that's why I'm kind of just sharing a few of the kind of activities that we do when we have our 2.5 day academy, which if there's time at the end, we can talk about, but community-based perspectives versus school-based perspectives. So we, we ask participants and readers of the book to engage activities like this, where they must take one issue and they must explain and historicize why they would see the issue different from people that they serve, from parents and students, and to historicize why that is the case. Another kind of thing that we do is a, a culturally responsive uh, hiring tool. So there are six or seven capacities that we test for when hiring a culturally responsive, I mean, you need culturally responsive teachers, right? And hiring is a big part of what leaders must do. But are you hiring more of the same or are you trying to hire people with fresh perspective? Right. Okay, so and then chapter two is another framing chapter of the book, critical self-reflection. And in this, we are looking at uh, <clears throat> using student voice as a way to push how we think. We're looking at using equity audits to change and to uh, allow us to see things about ourselves as leaders that others help us to see about ourselves that we can't see. And so these are some of the things that we talk about in this particular chapter. But this diagram, which happens to be in the book, is really useful. Most leaders are stuck in the red box up at the top, which asks, how do I personally reflect on my own privilege, power, and oppression? And that's a good question for leaders to ask, and they must ask that question. So this entire chapter is about critical self-reflection. How am I being complicit in reproducing oppressive or am I just, am I being hands off? And am I, I, am I allowing people that, I, that are under my tutelage that I am serving, am I allowing them to continue to become oppressed? And you're right. For those people stuck in the red box, it is a question they must ask. But how is that leadership? That's why the green box is there. How are your programs? How are you reflecting with your staff? And the purple box is there, which is to say, how are the structures in the building? How are the programmatic data? How is the overall school? So now we're looking at data and personal relationships of our leadership in these two boxes. And unfortunately, there are some people who are also stuck in these boxes. And, um, and when their data doesn't change, so in other words, if you're in the purple box and you're looking at your programmatic data, your school data, you're looking at all of the data, and it's not changing from one year to the next. And you're, you're crying with your colleagues and all upset every year when you talk about the race data. You have to talk about your race data every year. You know that multiple times a year. And when you do that, you're crying every time because the data is not changing. But you are looking at the data. That means that you are stuck in the purple box. You actually need to go up to the red box and ask, what is it about you as a leader that you're not seeing? So all of these boxes need to be simultaneously engaged you know, while a person reflects on this. And the kind of activity that we do with this is also historicizing activities. So for example, we start with current school practices that are oppressive on the right side of this table. And we go back and we historicize and we theorize about earlier forms of thinking. Now this is specific for US context, this particular, uh, these particular examples, but this kind of activity can be used against, uh, with people from any context, okay? And of course, we have other activities, organizational self-critiques. There are a number of things that uh, people here love to use, PBIS, restorative justice, and other things that they try to use in schools, and it doesn't do anything different for them because they haven't had the critical thinking that we've been talking about. They just pick up a new tool, and I guess out of just an urgency to uh, fix the problem or maybe a laziness of really de delving deep around the, the problem, uh, they just pick a new tool up and they start trying something new without really doing that properly. And they always end up replicating the same results every time. Chapter three uh, deals with space, school space versus community space, and are they compatible? And we have to understand that minoritized students are connected to sp the spaces they come from. So teachers speak disparagingly about some spaces in the school, and they recognize that it's not a space that they welcome. But all of the resilience, all of the genius, the agency that students have, they got that from those spaces that teachers are talking about. So um, I draw in this chapter out that exclusionary practices or to be exclusionary towards students is both formal and it's informal. 
The formal is the suspension data, the discipline data. We get that. But according to research here in the US, some of the most talented and the smartest students are the ones that leave school. We don't even call them dropouts anymore. We call them pushouts because of this last point, which is to say that there's all of these non formal ways of pressuring students to make them feel unwelcomed in school. And that is more impactful in their lives than the formal often. In other words, when you shame a student, when you tokenize some students, when you deal mate with students, like if you just sit back in the back of the classroom and you don't bother me, I'll give you a C in the end of the year, right? That kind of deal making or exoticizing or any of these other ways of informally being hostile towards students, that's more impactful than the formal stuff of actual suspensions, you know? And so we talk about those in this chapter and we center community in this entire chapter as well. You know, we always bring it back to community-based ways of knowing how do the people you serve understand the world and how do they see you and do they have good reason to see you like that? And then we uh, have different activities. The, the disturbing data activity is one that we spend an hour with where they bring data in with them. School leaders bring actual school data and we unpack it and historicize it and all of that. Chapter four deals with student identity. Identity. I remember I told you earlier, I broke this into two separate chapters. So student identity, and we deal with some theories that are well known, You know, cultural capital, humanization, cultural power. Uh, funds of knowledge, right? These are all theoretical things that we make very applicable in this particular chapter. We don't just talk about dehumanization and humanization. I spend quite a bit of time on, on this in the book as well as in our academy. But we, we add in this chapter, we also add something else called identity confluence. We, we refer to it as identity confluence. In other words, stop trying so hard to force assimilation on students. You should assimilate to them, not them to you. Stop forcing them to change who they are as people. Instead, allow them to be as they are and add an academic identity. We say we're educators. Why are we trying to change who they are as people? What does that have to do with education? There are many people, Jay-Z is a billionaire. There are many people who are there and they haven't changed who they are as people and they were very successful. Don't give that to me. If they need to be successful in Ireland or America, they need to change and become. No, they don't need to change and become like you. They don't. And they should not. That's a type of oppression. So allow them to be as they are as people and add an academic identity on top of that. That's all you need to give them. An academic, the tools, help them see themselves as being smart without changing to be little white Irishmen or little white Americans or whatever. And we talk about that in detail in this particular chapter. We also do culturally responsive classroom observation tool with this chapter. All right. And so most observation tools that leaders use when they go into classrooms don't have anything to do with equity. And I think that's a massive, a huge mistake. They must have equity lens embedded throughout the entire tool. All right. Then in chapter five, we really, really critique this whole instructional leadership model that all of our colleagues really believe that they have, which is to say that in the top model, in this, this diagram also, all of these diagrams I've been sharing with you are in the book, by the way, not the activities, all of them, but the diagrams are all there. Most of us think that at the higher level, if you institute a new policy, and then at the district level or the, you know, um, I don't know what you call it in Ireland, but you know, the organization that manages multiple schools at that level, you pass a policy, there's a board, you pass a policy, and that policy comes to the school level and is supposed to change leadership practice. And that will somehow uh, shift to teacher practice and that will increase student performance. And this could not be anything further than the truth. It's not true. It doesn't happen that way. Not for culturally responsive leaders. All right, for culturally responsive leaders, the lens of the parents, the lens of the student, the community-based knowledge that lives within the students that they think they're helping, that needs to be a part of their model that they're helped with. And that will increase the student performance of all students, not just the, the select few, the privileged students in the building. 
And uh, we also do a lot with communities of practice and PLCs in the book. We, ha we have a few pages dedicated to that as well. And the kind of activities that we do with this particular chapter is something called that we call a curriculum check, right? Where, where we, we ask again, the leaders to bring a curriculum in and they check it for culturally responsive and culturally relevant uh, traits uh, using some activities that we've designed for them. All right, so, um, and then another one is a culturally responsive classroom observation tool that when people go and observe their teachers who are teaching, when leaders go observe their teachers to give feedback and to give counsel, that they use the right and the proper tools. Anyway, I talked a lot about the academies and I gave you some examples of the academies there, 2.5 days, leaders at all aspects at every level come, system leaders, school leaders, instructional leaders all come into a space for 2.5 days. They read the book, they read articles, and we really go deep with some of the activities that I've been sharing with you. And then of course, equity audits, there's been a big error and a mistake in terms of how people have been doing equity audits. And we do that very differently. With us, it's necessary to have root cause analysis. With most people who are doing equity audits, it's not a part of that work. All they do is come and describe the trend data and try to make inferences from that. There's no problem with that per se, but it's just short lived and it's not going to shift practice because you don't know why. So in our version of equity audits that we developed through my company, we always engage why are the disproportionalities? Why are the inequities happening? What are you doing well and what can you do to change that. So we always come up with recommendations based on the data of why. So we have a, a lit review, we have surveys, and we have interview focus groups that we pull this data together and help districts make sense of why those disproportionalities are continuing, what they can do about that. And, um, um, you know, so the root causes of that and also what they're doing well and how they can begin to prioritize their equity work. So, the, so ours is very different from what you see from other people. And then I'll just conclude by saying that, again, being to, be, to show up in a school and to be neutral about what we're talking about is a type of oppression. It's a colonized type of leadership. Uh, I would also say that it's necessary to establish with the communities you serve trust, as we all know from the research now, credibility, which is a part of trust. You have to be seen as credible and rapport, which is also a part of trust. And in order to do these things, you have to advocate for what's important for them, even if it's not connected to your school or education. Advocacy is the key. And then for the last two points, I think we've said a lot about that. Community-based epistemologies, uh, recognizing. You, you'll be shocked. I go all around this country talking to leaders. You'll be shocked to know that when I ask the question, have you ever asked your parents and your students what they want out of the school, you would be shocked to know that I have not yet, from thousands of leaders, actually, they're so colonized in how they think about schooling that they think they must take all direction from the top, and it's not true. They have never asked their parents and students, what do you want out of this school? And what do you expect to gain for you and your community and your people out of this school that I'm running? They've never asked the question. I mean, black, white, Latino, all of them, none of them have asked that question. It's a shame. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about in the last two points. And with that, I'll bring this show to an end and we can uh, talk a little bit just for maybe you know a few minutes if you have a couple of follow-up questions. I, I, I know I've overextended my stay, but maybe there's time for a question or two. No, thank you so much for sharing such a rich insight into you know, your experience. Uh, as a as an educator, but also how you've taken that into the research space. <clears throat> practical activities. I know that the the viewers are going to find that really really enlightening. I mean, one of the things that I hear when I listen to you is you're you're reclaiming the language, if you like, around a lot of what maybe leadership as a field could be accused of um, making also uh, neutral and almost simplifying into less dynamic models. Has that always been a goal for culturally responsive school leadership work that you've been engaged in? Yes, yes. <clears throat> uh, there are some people who engage critical theories and work that, that feel that everything needs to be torn down and just reestablished anew. I, I, I think that there, there, there's some legitimate uh, sentiments and even 
uh, history and research to support that. But my, my approach is a little bit different from that. I think that we have good bones and we have good structures up, but they need to be culturally responsive. They need, they, there is radical shifting that needs to happen in the tools and in the structures that we currently have. There, it, there is a need to completely establish some new structures. Like for example, this whole community space and being in the communities. And that, that's new, that's not, that's not an existing model within schools, right? But there are some things like how we learn as leaders and how we help our teachers learn. There's some good structures in place, some instructional leadership models, right? There, there are some good things in place with that, that we can, we can work within the bounds of that, but it just needs to be completely done, done completely differently and from a culturally responsive perspective and model. So I think it's a mix. I think some things we can, we can work with and we can improve, and there are some things that we need to start anew and we need to just bring them into how we, how we practice as leaders. Uh, a phrase you often hear is schools and their communities. And uh, it seems to me like you've really flipped that like colleagues I know from other cultural contexts too, they talk about communities and their schools. Um, so it seems like that flip is to, to center equity. Are you optimistic in your work so far for the promise of culturally responsive school leadership to, to tip that scales more equitably towards communities and their schools rather than schools and their communities? You know what? Um... People are, I, I can say that people are listening. I, I, I wouldn't use the word optimism yet, um, but I think that uh, I, I was shocked to see that, for example, our article is the most cited article of any leadership article for the past five years. I was shocked, I was shocked about that. And that it was published in the top education journal of all education journals, I was shocked about that. So I, I do think that people are, and then with the murder of George, so I just recently moved to Ohio from Minneapolis, I was in, as, as you read, I was in Minneapolis when George Floyd was killed. I was in Minneapolis when the world shifted uh, with tectonic plates last year um, when he, he was murdered by a police officer. And uh, I, so, so I think that we're at a critical juncture now where people are listening more and wanting to do more. I don't know how long it will last. I hope long. But I think that we're at a point where people are at least willing to listen and engage it more. So I'm becoming more optimistic, but uh, I, I, I haven't yet reached optimism, but, I, but I'm hopeful. People are reaching out and from places that you would have never expected and hoping and trying and wanting to uh, engage this work a little bit more. And so, um, so yes, I, I, I think that uh, we have a long way to go before we can begin to say, uh, get most people saying communities and their schools. Um, but that that kind of language, it is powerful, but what 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 I would like to see more, what's more important for me than that is for people to actually do the work. I really don't care the terms you use as much, but can you begin to center the epistemologies and the knowledge and the experiences of those kids in your curriculum? Okay, call it schools and community, whatever you want to call it. Can you begin to do that? Can this, you begin yeah. to lift? Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Gavin. Go ahead. This is the showing up you mentioned, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. And that takes probably, you know, practical interventions like we we're talking about. Well, interventions, I know, is kind of airing on that clinical language again, right? But more so, it takes actions. At, but actions underpinned, what I'm really struck by in your work is the conceptual, the rich conceptual underpinnings that's, that are required to be the fuel in the engine to drive it, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, this is so, so I've had, I want you to know the journey too. I've had to learn how to speak to practitioners because we're so colonized in the academy and in, in higher education to only speak research talk and to, and to not be able to speak our, our research in ways. So it's very theoretically rich, as you said, and it's, re, it's empirical work. I've spent years collecting data, talking to leaders across the planet. So it's empirical work as well, but I'm trying to present the work and write about the work in ways that people who are in schools can access. Mm. So, so that's, that's a skill set that I did not have seven years ago. So, <laughs> And what you're touching on is one of those false dualisms, isn't it? That we can fall into a camp that's somewhat diametrically opposed when actually, as you point out, so much of that rich theorization comes from communities of, of practice in the in the broad, more generic sense of the term. Um, 
part of the showing up and unlearning and another uh, kind of thread in my mind, possibly because one of my own areas of research is around educational leadership preparation, principal preparation, it strikes me like we can do more to embed this work, not just as an add-on, but a a as a core, as a filtering lens to what we do. And I was struck too by the, the, the Wallace Foundation review by Jason Grissom, uh, Constance Lindsay and Anna Egalite. They talked about filtering everything through an equity lens. Can we take a culturally responsive school leadership approach for that lens of equity maybe? I think that's the only way to take uh, what what the, the mistake and please forgive me for talking about race i know that um you know uh may, maybe it's abrasive for people that we've we've begun to embrace discourses around race here so for it's it's not it's not offensive for me in this context at all to say white people will see this this way with people of color may see it that way um for white people it's just about equity in most cases because you can focus singularly on making sure that the outputs of black students are the same as of white students but for equity you should understand that what scholars talk about here of color such as myself is that when in order for you to get your parity in data your equitable data there's something that black people like me have to give up in order for you to get that so in other words i have to enter a school okay i have to behave like i'm a white person I have to be, endure the trauma of being targeted because of my race and all of these things in order for that school leader to say, ah, we have equity now, right? So how is that equity? If white students don't have to give the same thing up, just so you can have your parity in data. So there are all of these other questions that scholars of color are now asking about how, how scholars who talk about equity have been talking about that. For us, it's not just about indices and, measure, and, and, and statistical data and, you know, whether or not students can have the same grades or graduation rate. That's part of equity, but that's not the entirety of it. And so that's why culturally responsiveness requires us to ask additional questions about community, about epistemology, about how a sense of belonging, all of these kind of questions that uh, can fall under the radar of traditional equity uh, language and equity speak for many of my scholars. And so, for example, when Mark Gooden and I and a team of six, there were a team of six, did a, um, a Wallace report last year that's not yet been released about equity in the principal pipeline, we did it from a culturally responsive perspective. All right, there's, there's a difference. It's a difference. And I guess with the data discourse, broadly speaking, it allows or at least somewhat uh, posits this data is neutral and this is core to your work, right? We need to move beyond this uh, alleged neutrality. And, you know, there's that other line of inquiry in the research around data in which it states we interpret data through our values. So, again, this really connects to the unlearning and the showing up in how we interpret data and and not just leave the number speak, for example. And data is never neutral. Mm -hmm. That's the point. First of all, data, even the data that is toted is new. There's, there's, there's a very, very long running myth that data is neutral and it never is neutral. Number one, number two, student voices data, parent voices data. Why is that not considered as data by these same leaders, you know? But even when they were doing a skull size eugenic experiment, so in the beginning of colonization, it was about religion and religious authority that shifted to science. And at that time, the entire science community, the entire science community that they thought they were neutral were looking at skull sizes as a way to determine who was human and who was not and who was more intelligent. All right. So you would send the same skulls to the French and they would say, oh, the big the big heads here, the big skulls, they're French and then the British and German. And then you would send the same skulls to the German and they would say, oh, these big skulls are German and then the British and French, the same skulls making categorical errors because now, of course, first of all, do you know any white people with big heads who are not intelligent? That's a question for you. Well, I mean, yes, of course you do. Do yeah. you know any black people with small heads who are intelligent? So in other words, what does intelligence have to do with skull size? Nothing. Mm -hmm. So the experimentation part of it may have been neutral, but what was the epistemology behind why you even asked the question? 
So data has never been neutral, number one. Number two, why are they focused on certain types of data and ignoring student voices data, parent voices data, community voices data? So this whole thing that equity people have been doing has been really, unfortunately, and, and it's, that's exactly the reason why for the past 70 years, 100 years, nothing has changed for many people in this country. Can I ask a final question? If I were a school leader uh, who was listening today and I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, enact culturally responsive school leadership in my school and begin this journey, right? Because I don't think it, there's an end point ever. It's the continuous practice. What kinds of challenges might I expect in getting off the ground? And maybe you could speak to that so we can sustain people who, who want to go there, you know, just one or two. Yeah, absolutely. I have an entire section in my book about this, but the first thing that they have to do is they have to build trust among people. They have to find out who in their staff is with them on this journey, who, uh, as we say, where I'm from, who's ride or die, who will ride with them or die with them. Like who's there with them. When they establish this team, establish an equity team, then that's when you, cause you can't do it just by yourself. And there are people at every level, teacher level, other administrators, even people in the community who will ride with you, who will be there with you as you engage in this work. And then the second thing that is you got to start having to do, you can't guess your way through this work. And you can't look at, oh, this worked in that country or this worked in that city or this worked in that state. It can work for, you can't make that assumption. You have to, once you get your team, look at doing some sort of equity audit. It doesn't have to be the full one like us. It could be a YPAR project. It could be a community listening tour in forums, but you have to have some way of understanding where the pain and the trauma and what the people that you serve want. And an equity audit is the most talked about and systematic way of doing that. But there, as I was just saying, there are other ways of doing that too. So that would be a couple of places where they should start. They can expect resistance, which is why they need that team. There will be people in every single school that don't understand the benefit and why the work is being done. But you have to push through with courage, right? So, Dr. Khalifa, thank you so much. I think they're really good words to end on uh, for, for our audience today. And I'm really grateful for you sharing your, your wisdom and all of this really wonderful field pushing knowledge. Uh, for our communities uh, transatlantically and hopefully even more globally than that. So thank you so much. Dr. Murphy has been such a delight and a pleasure and I hope that we have the opportunity again soon. Okay, take care. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye.